Terry, how did you come to make a film about Soviet hippies? It's of course a, a long journey. Uh, I think several of my interests somehow come together with this topic about the Soviet hippies. Um, first of all, I've been always interested in resistance uh, movements and, and kind of uh, different ways of, uh, of uh, coping with the reality. Uh, I've been fascinated about the uh, you know, hippie movement in the West since my teenage time. I was s sort of in love with Jim Morrison and I was into the rock music. And, and uh, during my master's studies I, 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 I spent um, half a year in Russia and I wrote my thesis about memory culture. And that's where I kind of like, realized how, how memory or cultural memory is always very ideological how we you know, project the past or what we know about the past. And then uh, as a kid that was born in the Soviet Union but grown up in the post-socialist Estonia, then you know, all what we uh, were told about the Soviet area was that you know, it was just a, you know, propaganda everywhere and people just like marching uh, like pioneers and, and there was no this kind of cultural resistance or cultural creativity or different kind of imagination. And then uh, I, I, I found a book uh, that was written by Vladimir Wiedemann, who is also one of our protagonists. And that book blew my mind and that's where basically my research started. And then I, I had to do uh, anthropological research, meet people, do interviews to convince uh, also the funders that hey there's a story there was a movement that nobody really knows about anything and uh, basically um, at the beginning uh, they didn't believe me even though they were you know also like they lived their lives in the Soviet area they were older than me but you know nobody knew about this movement it was totally underground there was no official media that was projecting the movement and then in the post-socialist uh, conditions people were mostly engaged with the trauma but they were not like kind of bringing out this kind of more positive narratives that they they were resistant there were people who were actually doing their own way the accusation of the uh, official soviet union was always that this was something uh, inspired from the west it was was it the hippie movement yes uh, yes, it started uh, definitely a, as a reflection of what was happening in the West. The information sort of leaked through the Iron Curtain and inspired the youth. Of course, first of all, the music. And, and uh, you know, being in the Soviet Union, a, a young kid, and then you hear this, you know, different kind of wave. It's like, a, you know, like one of our protagonists says that this strange vibration and really this, you know, distorted guitar sound, it, it really seemed to communicate some kind of other possible reality and so the music was certainly the first source of divergence but then also they heard about Woodstock they saw pictures there were some kind of bootlegged uh, Finnish magazines or Czech magazines which were like writing about the hippie movement in the West and that uh, you know obviously made uh, made it its uh, you know twist here so there was this kind of imagined uh, community with their pairs in the West but then later, um, the next generation of kids picked over this legacy and I would say that by the end of 70s it was a unique subculture of its own. It was not just a bare mimicking of uh, what was happening in the West, but the hippies in the Soviet Union had their own systema, the system. What was the system? The system. The uh, system is basically like a network of people. Uh, so they had notebooks where they wrote down phone numbers and addresses of other hairy hippie people from other cities. So when they traveled to a different city, they immediately found a place to stay and, um, you know, friends, um, weed, girls, boys, you know, it was, uh, it, it really was this kind of self-supportive and sustainable and growing. Uh, system of people and they also had their own rituals like summer camps they had their slang very specific slang they didn't say apartment but they said flat but <laughs> you know, it's like uh, lots of anglicism yeah and uh, this was all over the Soviet Union or also in other uh, countries behind the Iron Curtain 
Uh, there were certainly also some kind of hippies and hippie movements in uh, other countries uh, behind the Iron Curtain, like Romania or Poland. But uh, my documentary concentrates specifically on the Soviet uh, Union because that was where the Sistema was, and that was where you know people were really connected. But uh, the hippie movement considered, uh, in general, only the bigger cities. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know the capitals of, of each uh, uh, you know Republic Tallinn Riga Vilnius Kaunas uh, Lviv in Ukraine of course Moscow and Petersburg were essential but then other cities across the Soviet Union. Uh, you were saying that uh, images of Woodstock played a role, music played a role. Did literature, did the beat literature, for example, uh, play a role? Uh, yes, sure. Yes, uh, of course they were. They made this uh, samistat, which is like self-made uh, books, and of course that was how also spiritual literature started to sort of spread around. And there was a lot of this kind of exoticism towards these things. So it was like this secret knowledge because the Soviet Air, uh, Union, as we know, was an atheist uh, country. So any kind of spirituality was already an alternative. So uh, the youth were interested in meditation, yoga, uh, there was a Hare Krishna movement in the Soviet Union. <laughs> yeah. what, uh, what was the reaction of the system? I mean of the of official, official system, system, not the system of the hippies, but the mm -hmm. official uh, Soviet Union. Um, in the late 60s there was not really you know specific reaction yet like I, I think the authorities sort of like didn't quite understand what was going on and then they saw it as a threat that would destroy the Soviet ideology. So uh, from 1970 and 71 they started taking the measures and what is um, also explicit in the documentary is one of the key moments uh, where the authorities sort of killed the movement and pushed it deep underground. So that was in 1971 when on the 1st of June the Soviet hippies in Moscow decided that they would do a first public demonstration. They would come out on the streets and make a protest against Vietnam War, which was supposed to be in line with the official ideology, right? But actually it was kind of like a trap set by the KGB. So when these kids came together, there were already buses waiting and they basically arrested everybody who came there. And that meant that their names were taken down, their addresses were taken down, and after that this systematic repression followed. The boys received an invitation to army, the you know, people who were students were sort of like, you know, that you know, you, you better be careful otherwise we will kick you out from the university. And of course the leaders or the most charismatic people, they were jailed or sent to psychiatric hospitals. So uh, after that it was already like existential choice to be a hippie. It was not anymore just oh, I just grow, grow some hair and play, you know, play some music. But uh, if you were a hippie, you sort of accepted that you are an outsider of the Soviet mainstream reality, and that's when it went also more radical. Drugs came in, and and alcohol, and 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 real this kind of hardcore system then spread around. Would you say the repression f did function? Um, yes, uh, of course, um, like we are, of course there are like lots of positive memories uh, regarding the hippies, um, the hippie movement, but um, I, I, I still have the feeling that these people were deeply paranoid as well, because a lot of them were uh, surveyed, some of them had, uh, you know, harsh experiences in, in jail, living together with real criminals, with all the insects of the, you know, Soviet jail, and um, and uh, psychiatric hospitals, electric shocks, or uh, I mean, it was the if if you if you were caught, uh, it was very severe. But they usually tried to sort of like make their way that the authorities wouldn't see them and they wouldn't see and they, uh, yeah they they kind of like tried to avoid the Soviet state as much as it was possible. An official position of the Soviet Union was that drugs were a problem of uh, the capitalist system and so on and so on. What was the uh, drug reality? Yeah, it's interesting that in late 60s 
For example, in Estonian Soviet media, they published the articles about LSD consumption in the West, and that was where they sort of like uh, were demonstrating that look, uh, the capitalism totally failed. Uh, you know, uh, kids are uh, you know going crazy with some kind of weird drug that uh, uh, creates like nightmare. And of course, the Soviet hippie kids were like, "Oh, that sounds fun!" <laughs> 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 and then they started inventing their own uh, you know ways. Um, I would say that very few uh, hippies had LSD experiences because LSD was really not around. Um, like for example, one of my protagonists uh, said that uh, a, w a Western hippie sent a postcard and under the stamp there was <laughs> LSD. So that was like his experiences, but that was very unique. Mostly they didn't have LSD. There was uh, some weed around, and weed was grown in the Soviet uh, Union for industrial purposes. But of course, if you you know you are traveling somewhere in Ukraine or Central Asia, and then you find these huge fields of marijuana, and then there's a legend that they sent naked girls uh, running through these fields, and then later they were just kind of like you know getting the the hash from their uh, skin. So. Um, uh, but there were also uh, some more. Uh, you know, crazy or you know the, the the psychonauts of the hippies discovered their more like hardcore thing. For example, uh, in the in the movie, there's uh, a story about asthmatol cigarettes, which were cigarettes intended for asthmatics, but they consisted uh, various hallucinogenic plants that are supposedly relaxing your lungs, and they do. Uh, but if you make a tea out of it then you, you get a very trippy experience. And uh, another like a legendary thing was called Sopals, which is a cleaning detergent. And that was produced in Riga. And then somehow the hippies discovered it and then they were sniffing it. And uh, the active component is ether. And some Soviet hippies say that it was like better than LSD. Yeah. How about uh, opium? And, uh yes, opium was also, it was like rather in late 70s and uh, again the legend says that you know suddenly when the hippies discovered opium there were no more poppy flowers again okay, <laughs> around the Soviet monuments <laughs> because hippies just like um, picked it up. But this is also a sensitive topic because uh, they usually consumed it in the form of tea, but it was very difficult to measure what was the proper dosage. So a lot of people lost their friends because of the opium tea. Because they died of Yes, uh, they died of an overdose. Of of opium tea. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. And a heroin or cocaine? Mm, no, no, no. no. Now your film is uh, made in a very special way. It's uh, you know not a classic documentary. Uh, could you elaborate a bit uh, what 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 you did? Mm. Yes, we. Mm, I, I I certainly wanted to make a pop culture story uh, uh, because I. You know, as nobody, you know, up to up to the almost up to the point, nobody knows that there were hippies in the Soviet Union. I wanted to focus on the historical story, but. It's a hippie documentary, so I, I always thought that this is a documentary that requires a much more creative editing and this kind of... Uh, I wanted to have the film this kind of affective layer of kind of feeling the Soviet hippie world. And that feeling um, we tried to create through this kind of creative use of archives. Uh, we were quite brave of using photos, for example, but we made them kind of like in a try to like present them in a in a more funky way, and we also used animation. And the animation uh, we had like uh, animation from the 70s to illustrate the psychedelic sensitivity that was created in the in the Soviet area. Or a, a graphic designer uh, work is there. Um, I I live in uh, uh, kind of. Uh, uh, a sun which like then uh, circles around the, the uh, Sonce, who was one of the characters who sort of somehow invented the Sistema. So we used these kind of like pieces to, to, to illustrate uh, this really, um, you know, the more arty uh, uh, and, and uh, f side of the Soviet hippie movement in a wider sense and, and also this kind of sensitivity. And, uh, and then we also created some new animations to again deepen this kind of psychedelic uh, part of the story. 
Then uh, music is quite important. Is this new music or is it all old? No, uh, uh, I treated music as also part of the archive that I wanted to, you know, bring out for the wider audience. So uh, I, it was like my principal choice to use 100% music that was produced in the underground Soviet Union, except for one song that was uh, from Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia, which is still a satellite country. So. Yes, like there are some hidden treasures that uh, very few people know, especially from the Russia. And then there are some, uh, you know, beloved uh, uh, songs from uh, Soviet Estonia, which Estonians already know, but the world is yet to discover them. And, uh, and the music has indeed received a lot of positive feedback and we hope to release the soundtrack as well. I hope so too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Mm -hmm. How was it with rides? Did you have uh, lots of problems getting all the rides for all these? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, the music rights were already very expensive, uh, but uh, like I said, that it was like a principal choice, and unfortunately, my producer agreed, and and and, uh, and that kind of adds the creative layer of the, of the movie. Uh, but archive uh, was a tricky as well, and and uh, my producer Liz Lepic had hard times to kind of uh, you know get all the rights together because like a lot of them was also sort of like a found archive that nobody quite knew who actually took the photo mm -hmm. because the, in, within the Sistema they also exchanged photos they had the so-called people's book and they were like you know copying the, their photos and, and sharing it with other hippies so you could find same photo in several people's book across the you know Soviet Union so they had the people's book uh, where they had hippies from Lviv and from Ufa and from Tallinn and so on and so on so actually the authorship was very very vague but it's made, people's book means that uh, uh, lots of people had the same book. No, they created. They created themselves mm -hmm. a book that uh, Alik uh, from Ukraine, like one of our protagonists, says that this was a hippie bible. Yes. Because it was basically showing the photos of all mm -hmm. the people mm -hmm. that were sort of like the members of the Sistema. And, and that's how they located themselves. So it also demonstrates uh, how, you know, that was the time before the internet or anything but they sort of envisioned that there was a movement there was a network and there were people and they were like kind of eager to learn each other uh, to get to know each other and they to meet themselves and that's when they traveled to spend their summers in Gaia in Latvia and and so on um, before you were saying that one of the protagonists uh, wrote a book that uh, brought you to this uh, subject, what, what book was that? Uh, it is a, uh, the book is entitled The School of Magicians mm -hmm. uh, by Vladimir Wiedemann. It was uh, written in Estonian and Russian. And so when, when was it published? Um, it was published in 2007. Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. So in you were one. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes. But during the movement, there were no, uh, uh, there were only the Samistat publications. Yeah, that because like, uh, you know, camera was one of the first things that the KGB agents took away from the hippies. The cameras. Yes, cameras. So in a way, at the beginning, I anticipated that we will not find any film footage for use of the film. But but fortunately, we had uh, luck and the news about our project and me uh, spread around the community so people already knew that there is this Teria from Estonia working on this documentary and, and had been already working for several years so it's kind of like, like went like that and uh, but what I was saying is that uh, Soviet in the Soviet official discourse the hippies didn't exist mm -hmm. it was you know <coughs> There was no evidence in the in the official media that there were hippies. And when the you know President Nixon came to Moscow in 1972 or in 1980 when they had Olympic Games, they cleaned the streets from the hippies, from the hairy fellows, mm -hmm. to you know show that in the Soviet Union everything is very very nice. <laughs> uh, we don't have the rebellious kids now because everybody really believes in the in the communism, and um, so. That's why, like, it was kind of like a, like a, you know, hidden history, and and that's why I had to use this oral history method to meet people, to talk with them, and yes, there were like a few, you know, hippie memoirs that started to appear, and and a few have been published in Russian as well. 
I was also astonished, uh, as you said, there were uh, also um, uh, film film documents uh, that they made themselves. Uh, what, what kind of cameras did they have? How did uh, they they had Super 8 cameras. You could get that easily in the Soviet Union? Uh, no, uh, it was expensive, but some people uh, mm -hmm. you know, got it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, they were you know, able to afford it and then they were filming in a way that they already like realized that what they do is something uh, important. So they took photos of each other and they filmed the, mm -hmm. their journeys and something mm -hmm. like that. But uh, it was still quite rare. It was, it was not that everybody was filming all the time, but, uh, but fortunately there were a few guys uh, mostly guys who, who had cameras and who were filming their journeys or, or, or their summers and, uh, and so on. Yeah. Um, did you also try to get archive material from uh, the KGB or ancient secret services? Uh, yes, uh, of course. Uh, I, was, I was dreaming about uh, finding something because um, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, KGB used the uh, camera within their surveillance practices because they really uh, thought uh, that, I mean, they were really uh, suspecting that the Sistema is a real, uh, you know, organization that wants to convert the regime. Uh, of course, they wanted to convert the regime and for them, them themselves, they already converted it. They had their own world uh, within their own, you know, with their own freedoms. But, uh, but of course, the authorities were really suspicious that, you know, there is you know, something really uh, going on and they were following the hippies and they were filming them from distance. Uh, but um, uh, in Estonia, uh, most of the KGB archives were, were taken to Moscow in the late 80s. So, uh, for example, in Estonian KGB archive, there was no visual material. I only found uh, a few documents how uh, you know, hippies were reported about that. Oh, like now, like lately, we have these hairy fellows on the street that seem to mimic the, the you know, the, the bad, demoralized Western, uh, you know, influences, and and we need to take serious measures to 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 treat with the, uh, these kids. So that kind of documents I found, but that was not interesting to show in the in the in the in the documentary. In uh, Lithuania, the same, and um, then uh, fortunately, just uh, lately, recently, they opened KGB archives in uh, in Kiev, in Ukraine, uh, but. Uh, it was uh, chaotic and it was not, not yet uh, uh, sort of organized and uh, uh, but uh, my research advisor visited the archive and uh, there was no uh, film footage at least not available uh, but uh, she found uh, some uh, photos that was really, you know, done by the KGB. Like, okay, so this is the hippie organization, and they had the photos of these, you know, suspects. Yeah. But of course, the Russian KGB archives, no. They are Ever. totally closed. Yes, like uh, there is no such thing as KGB archive where, where which you can access. Now you're not. Uh, uh, um, you didn't start out as a filmmaker. You're an anthropologist, and this led you to uh, filmmaking. Could you tell a bit how? Yes, my, my background is in anthropology and I'm currently still working on my PhD. And documentary for me is also like kind of making an, an anthropology. I am uh, especially fascinated about research-based uh, you know, documentaries that uh, kind of tell an anthropological story but you know, make it more accessible, more visible uh, for wider audiences than maybe an academic paper can do. And probably it's also you know, my own thing that uh, I'm interested in visual and maybe there's an artist in me that, that want to you know, use visual material and, and documentary is perhaps my, my language. I think you know, like one thing that motivated me to work on this project, uh, not just an, an, an ambition to make a documentary or or you know get my voice out there, uh, but it was really to to you know kind of shed the light on the history of pacifism in the you know that part of the world where people you know don't even imagine that there was uh, this pacifism and uh, and I think it the. Uh, uh, what the, what the film at least tries to 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 to, to highlight is that uh, 
the, the struggle is still the same, even though that the situation in Russia has changed almost 180 percent, uh, 180 degrees, then um, the struggle is still the same. Uh, there are still, you know, bodies and practices that are being policed by the by the by the regime, and uh, and uh, and to 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 emphasize the the you know peaceful ways of, of being in the world or doing politics, I think it's very, very crucial, uh, not only back then, but also now. So it's a political film? Uh, for me, yes, and I, I chose it deliberately to, to focus on the power relations, because uh, I, I think this is the most crucial thing, and, and in a way some people have also noticed that the film is a bit sad, and, and it is sad. For me as well, I, it's it's beautiful and and powerful and imaginative in one side, but on the other hand, also like uh, these people with their ideals, it's very very you know, gentle. It's very small and it's it's almost like a <laughs> and and that's it. But uh, I think it's important to 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 witness and and respect and encourage uh, this kind of protest. Because I think for me this is about protest. The, the, the sad part is, uh, could you say somehow, is uh, age and uh, the decay of bodies? Uh, uh, yeah, possibly partly that, of course. Uh, for me, I found all the hippies with their grey beards extremely beautiful. I don't have problem with that. But uh, but in a, in a way that you know when we, when we see these you know kids uh, from various generations coming together in Moscow on the first of June and they say that you know what can we do like we cannot go on the streets and protest because nobody would hear us and 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 again the same struggle as back at the time that if they are too vocal you know we all know what happened to the pussy riot etc so it's uh, it's it's really uh, you know. Uh, sad in that sense that it is very you know these ideals that they they carry with their bodies and minds are, are very crucial yet they are you know so <sighs> I, I, I want to believe that they have power and I, I wish they, they have power and, and, and these kind of ideals um, are supposed to have power but on the other hand uh, it's a struggle it's still a struggle that they were uh, making this trip, this was because of you, because you were filming them. Um, was it? Uh, it was a collaboration. Um, when you know we were working on the film, and and of course the traveling was essential part of the Soviet hippie identity. All of them were on the road, hitchhiking at some point of their lives. So uh, that's where it kind of came. That okay, maybe we can also do something while we are doing this 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 project, this film together. Maybe there's somewhere where you will want to go, and then the first of June, Moscow, sort of came up. And uh, and that was when it was like it was collaborative. It was not that. Um, that I didn't want to put myself into the position that I'm the tour leader and I say, okay, now we go there, 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 and we have booked the hotels there, there, there. Uh, while at the same time, I was still, you know, they knew that we are making movie and 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 they wanted to help me to make the movie or tell the story. So it was it was a kind of like a collaboration. So I cannot, uh, you know, also say that. Uh, uh, they were doing everything and we were just following because we were also contributing, we paid the petrol, for example. <laughs> yeah.